what is important to you when we're discussing fatherhood? How much value fathers provide to the world, mm. to their communities, to their families, to their kids, to the mothers of their kids, and ideally to themselves. We were off the air and you were talking about uh, these elements and also fathers need help and support. So I'd love to, you know, we, we know and here in at, you know, the Feel Good Father Listening, we know the positive impact that we can have. And so I'd love to hear your take on the support and the help and, and what's going on. And we'll, we'll go from there. Okay. Well, let's take a, a, a simple one, a simple topic, a simple issue. Um, you know, work-life balance. There are numbers that show that fathers, even more than mothers these days, are saying they do not spend enough time with their kids. It's almost twice as many fathers who are saying, I want to spend more time with my kids. I need to spend more time with my kids. My kids need me to spend more time with them. About twice as much as there are women saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, that's hugely underrecognized. Um, parental leave at the big corporations. Corporations mm -hmm. understand that for them to get the best female talent, they need to provide flexibility for their female employees to be both really good employees and really happy with their home life. Not so much is it understood that the same thing needs to apply to keeping their best male employees, because more and more men are saying, I don't, I don't want to be like the previous generation of fathers was, where they thought that the way, that the way, the one and only way they showed their love for their kids and their value to their communities and their commitment to their wives was to get on a train every morning, ride it for an hour far away from their kids, work at a job that uh, they really didn't like, but it paid pretty good money, came back home when the kids were, you know, maybe getting ready to go to bed and, uh, you know, maybe you got the chance to read them a good night story if you were lucky. My father never had a chance to read me a good night story, but he was a very good man and a very good father until he became an alcoholic. Mm. So you can feel, you can feel me about what I'm feeling, right? I got um, you. Yeah. And I, and I think when we're, when we're talking about this, what I love is that you have a very specific you have a very specific uh, perspective from your retired social worker. I want to hear more about that piece and your retired social social worker from the Baltimore area. And so there's, there's just so many dynamics about everything that's going on there. I've had some social workers. One was from uh, Pennsylvania, another one from California. I'm really delighted to, to Maryland represent. <laughs> Here we go. So let's, let's talk about, uh, what, you know, what this, where does this come from, this perspective? I love it. Should I talk about my social work career? Because Just, it, yeah. Yeah, what's, I, you know, I what's got into social work late in my life. My interest in, my interest in fathers, well, my, my path to becoming a social worker probably began when I was about four or five or six or seven or eight years old. Okay. Um, should I go back that far? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> well, do you have are any of your kids' daughters? Yeah, I have two daughters. Okay. So you know that if are, are any of them good at sports or good at math? Math, yes. Okay. Yeah. So you know that it's not really a good thing for somebody to say to your daughter, gee, you're really good at math for a girl. Yes. Right? Yes. What I used to hear when I was a little boy was, gee, Jack, you're really good with babies for a boy. For a boy. For a boy. Okay. Now, what's the message there? Pretty, like, pretty much like the message to your daughter. It's a stupid message, but, you know, very deeply entrenched in the culture, much less so lately 
is, yeah. you know, math isn't really for girls. You know, playing with baby dolls is for girls. Mm. The message to me was being a kind, caring, loving, patient, nurturing person who can make kids feel good about themselves and make them laugh and be happy. That's not for you. You're supposed to be out there playing war. I love this. I love this because I remember very distinctly, I used to work at a horse ranch and the horse ranch had different areas. So there was like the barn, which was like working with the horses. There was groundskeeping, which is what I did. And then there was the kitchen. And I remember the one year that I worked there that we had, like there's a, you know, six or seven young, young guys coming in to work two or three in the barn. It was me and another guy doing the groundskeeper. And there was one guy that was working in the kitchen with the ladies and boy, did he catch flack. Now, mind you, this is, this would have been seventh or eighth grade. So 10 to 12, the guy was 10 to 12 and he was loving it. He loved, I could tell he loved cooking. He loved the environment of being in the kitchen you know, and, and what I think is really funny when I reflect on that situation is, okay, today the bear is this really popular and successful TV show yeah. about a bunch, about, about a bunch of chefs and the main, the main star of the show is a dude. He's one of the best chefs out there and he's a dude. And I, I think it's really funny how much we diminish the domestic activities for men. That's what you're talking about. The domestic activities for men. And as a dude that like, I love cooking. I love cooking for my family. I, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't think anybody really likes cleaning, but it's like, all right, I got a vacuum, do that. Fine. You know, teach, <laughs> got to fold laundry. Fine. <laughs> like that's, it's what we do. Uh, but you know, like I worked in a restaurant, I did the dishes. I was a busser. Uh, so I was washing the dishes, doing that kind of stuff. And it's like, Hey, this is a part of having a house and running it. So, Okay, this is so this is your path. You've got people saying these messages to you. That, that's that's awful. Um, wh- what's next? Okay, so then <clears throat> that was when I was a little kid. Then I was on a co-ed softball team. Hmm. And it was a lot of fun, hugely fun. Every Tuesday night we would play a game and then we would go out to a bar and um, you know, have some drinks and dance and maybe a little dinner. Um, and two weeks in a row, I remember one of my female teammates sitting me, sitting me at a table, talking to me about their boyfriends Mm. and they were telling a tale of woe about their boyfriends and both tales of woe ended with the woman saying to me, and so he's a real jerk. Don't you think? And I, both times I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe based on what you're telling me, he's a real jerk. But, you know, also on the other hand, from his point of view, maybe what you're talking about looks like this to him. And both times the women said, oh, my God, I never thought of that. Mm. Never thought of that. And to me, it was perfectly obvious. And so it sort of seemed to me that maybe... I could do some good here in the world by helping to articulate a male point of view for issues that, you know, seem to be very clear to half the population. When to men, I think they're, you know, recognized as being pretty complicated. Um, So I said to my girlfriend, who was also on the team, um, I think maybe I'm going to start a magazine. And about these issues, she said, well, you know, printing is pretty expensive. Postage is pretty expensive. Why don't you do a radio show? And I Mm. said, ah, great idea. So I contacted a local college radio station and told them what I wanted to do. They said, yeah, come on down. Well, they made me do a pilot. Come on down. This is good. And it worked. I mean, Mm. it worked for a college radio station. Sure. Um, and it became, I think, the the best, most successful public affairs show on that station. Um, so if you ever want to, you know, get a chance to talk to important and interesting people, call them up and say you got a radio show 
and or a podcast, right? And I yeah. want to talk with you and people, you'll get good people. So I had some really good people on my show. And it became quickly clear to me that this was more than just, you know, about relationships and love and romance and flowers. This was about really important social issues. And I started hearing about gender bias in the social services mm -hmm. from a lot of my guests that, mm -hmm. you know, social services really just isn't serving men very well. And then one day I got a flyer came across my desk. Uh, I didn't have a desk, got stuck into my little pigeonhole in the, in the, in the office. Flyer from um, the Baltimore Urban League. Okay about a conference they were going to do called Black Men and Endangered Species. Oh now, you've heard okay. that, you've probably heard that phrase a bit, but back then, this was a new thought, Black Men and Endangered Species. We know the problems of Black people, but the particular problems of Black men, I'm like, yes, I am all for that. Sure. Let's sure. talk about what's really going on with Black men. Well, for context, because I like I'm I'm following along with with where you're at. Could could you share the year? Because I think for yes, the yoga father listening this, and this, for and for, go ahead. Well, this was night. My show started in '83. I think it was '84 when I first met. I met the fellow. His name was Richard. Love uh, it. Was it 1984? In '85. 1984. In '85 and '86, we hit it off so well together. That in 85 and 86, we went down to Annapolis, the state capital of Maryland, to try to get Annapolis to establish a commission or a task force on something to take a look at the particular problems of being both black and male at the same time. It's a one-two yeah. punch. You're no good yeah. because you're black. You're no good because you're a man. Yeah. So I became very interested in the social issues okay. of men and how they were connected to the broader social issues that affect everybody. Totally. And, and keep in mind, I, I'm in Baltimore, a majority black city, very troubled, struggling very much. So late in life, my, my full-time job, my, my money-paying job was in IT. But at the age of, let's see, it was 19, it was 2005, so I would have been 54. I left my job, went to school for a, a, a dual degree in math, in, in uh, social work and business, got an MSW MBA, hoping I could get into a, a state agency to help work on these issues. Um, so I really couldn't find a job with any agency it was that was interested in talking about the social problems of men. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I did get a job in the Baltimore, the Baltimore City Jail. Okay. <laughs> right. And I saw a lot of what was going on with men in the Baltimore City Jail. But, I, you know, I did that for a year. It's not a great job. It's pretty hard. And then I got a job with the same department, Department of, uh, Social, the department of Corrections, and got a job as a probation officer in, in central Baltimore. Okay. okay. And that was much more hands-on. I could talk, you know, more at length with my, my clients. Um, and it became very clear that this idea I was – thinking I was seeing about a lot of the problems of Baltimore being based on race. Yes, we know, but also on gender and, and the, the sexism that these fellows are experiencing that we don't think about because you think about sexism, you think about what happens to women. You don't think about mm -hmm. what happens to men and it's happening to these fellows big time. And what can they say about it? Oh, poor boys, poor baby, as if men don't yeah. run the world. You know, there's a lot of that. So um, I was only a social worker uh, from 2008 till I retired in about 2013. Uh, I, I tried to establish an agency called Working Well with Men, where I offered myself out to agencies to help them do a better job working with men. I never had a paying client. Mm -hmm. I retired in 13. Uh, 2013, but I never lost my interest and passion for these issues. I worked, my last job before I retired was with National Fatherhood Initiative, okay. where I was, yeah. where I, my job was sort of as a trainer, sort of as a salesman to agencies, particularly correctional agencies around the country, 
for NFI's program called Inside Out Dad, which was a program developed by NFI to try to help incarcerated fathers maintain their relationships with their kids while they're locked up. And, you know, again, Baba do, Baba ding. You know, it's just so clear that there is a lot of merit to this. And um, when I was doing trainings for departments of corrections around the country, you could sort of, you could sort of use the experience experiences of the older correctional people to overcome the skepticism of the younger correctional people. The younger correctional people were, were, were very much more law enforcement interested. And we got to come down hard on these guys. And they need to be punished for the bad stuff they've done. The older people were like, no, you don't get this. These guys really need to be connected with their kids. It's good for all of us, including us, to have mm. men in jail who are recognizing that they have value for something other than how well they can fight. I think that is okay. I think that that is for, um, that's very profound, right? So most of the time when we think about the feel good father at world, right? We're, we're talking about having a much more comprehensive view of your, of the value you provide to the house. It's not just the, the cash you're bringing in. It maybe it's not just a romance you're bringing to your wife. There's there's everything else there, right? And so we have to figure out growing spiritually, growing the relationship with our kids, and, and stuff like that. And and from the perspective, it's it's about that holistic view. And we do this from the specific singular, like I'm in my home doing it. And what I love about what you're talking about is there's a, a larger scope of what's happening. And when we think about it, and I think about, you know, my age, so, you know, I'm in my forties. So I was a young kid in the eighties and then I was in high school basically in the nineties. And so then college, early two thousands there, you can kind of figure that out. I won't talk about my age, but, um, there's that piece. And so I've been aware of some of these issues, but I, I definitely think there's a sentence as a statement here, I think is super, super critical to understand is that men rise to the standard that you give them. Boys and men rise to that standard. And so if the standard, as you're saying, is you only have value on the street, you only have value when you're hustling, you only have value in how you fight. You know, I'm thinking about some of the successful influencers that are out there today saying like, when you're in your twenties, the only value you have is working yourself as a dog to the bone, which I did. Cause I was in tech, right? I was in video games. So I was crunching, you know, I would, I, I would say that over that 10 year span, every, every year I crunched for three months straight, which is 12 to 14 hour days, six days a week and a full day on Sunday. Right? Like that was just the pattern. And so it was like, yep, work yourself to the bone do all this kind of stuff, get the product out there. There we go. But I can absolutely see that um, there needs to be another communication. This is what we talk about in the faith world. This is what we talk about in, in the church, in Christianity. It's like, no, you have intrinsic value just in being alive. And I, I can't imagine, I, I know I can't imagine what, what that feels like to be a young man or a boy and just saying you have no value except for fighting how you fight or you have no value except the paycheck you come home like that to me is like that to me is the suspense thriller drama movie of like that i see it's like some random person or like the romantic interest is like you have no value except for the paycheck you bring in here so go get some more money go go steal from that bank and make and bring it home like in heat you know like <laughs> michael mann's movie right about uh, uh, well, it was a great movie. Um, but that's, that's interesting. Okay. That's, that's just me going. Um, I can see the plight. This is also covered in Dr. Um, Warren Farrell's boy crisis. There's a lot of this data in there about, and that was, that's what you got. Y'all are roughly around the same age. He was in New York city, like the same time period. So where do we go from here? Right? So you're, you're, you're retiring. You're at that next stage. Maybe now's a good time to talk about like, 
how fathers bring value to the house, how they bring value to, to kids. I once asked a psychiatrist friend of mine um, a gender-based question because I'm fascinated by gender issues. Mm. I, I asked him, I said, generally speaking, in your work with male patients and female patients, do you see anything that you can speak to generally, not absolutely, but general differences between your male patients and your female patients? He said, without a hesitation, he said, absolutely, no, no doubt about it. I said, well, what is it? He said, women tend to focus on what people need. Mm. Men tend to focus on what people deserve. And at first, That's interesting. And at first I said, well, isn't that the same thing? He said, no, think about it. Big difference between needing something and deserving something. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. And then, you know, you think about it, and it does make perfect sense because if in, in olden days, like ancient days, when the human race was a bunch of, a, a small band of people wandering around the grasslands of, of the Serengeti, um, and we were in danger of being extinctified by, you know, being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, it made sense to sort of specialize. You got the women who have the breasts, makes, makes sense for them to be the ones taking care of the kids, and it makes sense for the men to be one out there with the spears out on the periphery, mm -hmm. making sure the saber-toothed tigers don't get in. That mm -hmm. makes sense. So it makes sense that since the woman is with a brand new baby, that baby doesn't deserve anything, it hasn't earned anything. It just needs. And the mother can't be like, well, what, what have you done to deserve uh, the opportunity to suckle at my breast? It's not a question. Sure. You just, the baby needs this. On the other hand, sure. if we only pay attention to what babies need, they will always be babies. There has to be a transition to what the baby as a child, as a boy, as an adolescent, as a teenager, as a grown up, and this applies to women too, they have to participate in this too. There has to be a transition from what the, the foc from focusing on what the baby needs to what the adult or the adolescent or the young adult deserves. And that's, you know, the fulfillment of, of uh, uh, adulthood. You're not just taking care of yourself. You're not just worried about what you need or what you deserve. It's what do other people need? And how do you help them become deserving so that we, we can pass this machine of procreation down through the generations? So I think, I, I think to answer your question, directly after about three minutes of wandering around the question. Um, the, the thing that men bring to uh, parenting is a focus, a cooperative focus with the mother on where is the boundary and, and how, do, how, how does the dynamic tension between focusing on a kid's need and focusing on the kid's deserving how does that play out? How do we work together, husband and wife, male and female, mother and father? How do we work successfully and cooperatively in that gradual transition? And it's not like after the kid becomes an adult, the kid doesn't need the mother anymore. He still needs somebody to focus on, you know, certain needs. And ideally, the father has paid attention and says, yeah, well, this kid has needs too. Sometimes the kid doesn't really deserve anything. He's just being a knucklehead. And I'd like to whack him upside the head, but I can't because I'm his dad and I got to love him. And my job is just to love him and get him through this crazy period he's in right now. And then we'll get back to helping him see a better way to be an adult. I, I've always loved the expression that, you know, one of the things I think Dr. Jordan Peterson says this is that one of the roles of and let's just use a different term like because let's say the masculine energy, your masculine energy is calling that person into being. This is that standards thing, right? If you have a standard for performance as a father, 
and you're helping your son, daughter get to that raise to that standard of performance, you're, you're almost calling them into being as a coach would, right? When, when you're participating in a sport, we, we were talking about baseball and football and all these different sports off air. There's no value in a coach that's just going to, you did, you did your best, like get go like when, as you get older, like when you get to the point where you're actually competing, you know, like I remember I played, I played hockey up through midget. So, and I, I, I didn't make midget a. And so then because I didn't make midget a, there was no path to midget triple a, which goes into, um, your, uh, provincial or state leagues, which goes to NHL. So for me, it was midget B, which means maybe a college team, but general, like, it's like, kind of like play it because you love it. And that's, that's kind of where hockey goes. And I'm sure that there's similar systems in different sports, but there was no value once, once I hit about middle school to not have a coach that was teaching me how to, you know, I mean, when you're, when you go into middle school, you get into Bantam, which is your first contact. You, you need a coach. It's like, no, go hit that guy, go get the puck, go get aggressive, get in the corners, do your job. Like I played defense. So it's like, get in there, use your physicality. Like you're, you're, this is a battle. You're, it's a battle on the ice in your skates, get the puck, win the game. Right. And you want that person calling you out. And I think that that model is very similar. You know, when I think of like the great coaches, they absolutely have a standard for behavior. And, um, and I think that's something that, that fathers do uniquely bring. I think that's well, not uniquely, my apologies, instinctively bring. So, no, so, this is, that's, so I, that's the disciplinary stuff. I agree with everything you're saying. Um, it's important, I think, at this point, because you probably have listeners who are never good at sports. Yes. yes. But who had other talents that they might not have been as encouraged as you, because what you were doing was typically a male thing, you know, right. hitting somebody else on the ice. He, yeah, he might have been a poet or a painter, or a, a dancer, or a social worker type kid, um, that we all have things that we want to be appreciated for. Yes. And, you know, for you, it was relatively easy because you were doing it's a pretty typical sports thing. Whereas for other kids, you know, they get a lot of messages and they have a lot of worries and doubts and insecurities. Insecurities is big for boys and young men yeah. uh, about, you know, what's wrong with you? you know, being good for babies? That's not, what do you, that's weird. What's wrong with you? I was, I was just thinking about a lot of my artist friends. So when I was in gaming, I had a lot of artist friends. And I, and I think about, so I use a coach example, but the mentorship is just as critical. Having somebody that's like, that's a great idea. Go, I, I got you. I go do that thing. And I think of there's a, there's that point. I remember, um, when I was in middle school, I actually had, uh, I had a budding talent for drawing for doing pencils and charcoals and I had a budding talent for it. And there was a family friend who was an actual artist. And he was, he, we were just meeting and showing me and he was showing me how to do this. And it was like, my, I was getting better. And there was a path there. Like there was something like I was being able to do these things. Um, Cause I was, I was a super geek growing up, loved the D and D stuff, loved the fantasy. You know, my, my dad was really into the old eighties science fiction fantasy movie, like Conan, just that, that kind of era of, of like movies and, and all the science fiction, right? Aliens, the whole deal. Like you, you know, you name it, it was there. Terminator, that stuff. So I was very geeky. And, um, but, but when I moved to the States, so I moved from Toronto to Detroit. So my dad made cars and, um, and I moved there. And then when I went to that high school, because I was still developing, I remember my art teachers were like, they didn't even, they didn't, they weren't, there was no support. And, and when I look at the difference, it was like, there was a, there was a kid in class who was great, like budding talent, like really like in, you know, freshman, sophomore in high school, absolutely able to express himself in that way. And 
deserving of that mentorship. But I, you know, I always, sometimes I think like, oh man, if, if, if that relationship had stayed, where would my artistic expression be? Where would that have been at that time? And it's, it's like, Hey, I got to work on video games. I did some other things. So I, there, there's no regret there. It's simply an observation of, okay, there was somebody else that got, got nurtured. Was there room for my level? And I learned this very specifically. So one of the artists I like was Brom and I'll, I'll end and then we can kind of move on. So I learned from Brom. So Brom is a, um, I would say he's a romantic period character artist and it's a little bit more grotesque in science fiction. And what he, he's a horror artist. And he released once some art that he drew in high school. And it wasn't that different from what I was doing. And for him, there was just that, there was a, he described it as there were monsters in my head that had to get onto the page. And I I have, it was a compulsion to continue drawing. But I love the, when you brought the insecurity, I was not sure growing up. New country, completely away from my family that I'd grown up with absolutely vulnerable and then hopes and dreams crushed (laughs) like in a funny way, you know? Okay. So there's the mentorship piece, which I love that you're bringing up the insecurity. What, what else? Well, let's, let's um, continue talking about what goes on for black fathers. Yeah. And and I'm, I'm not just interested in black fathers, but Looking at what's going on with black fathers helps us to sort of recognize that being a man is not always, you know, peaches and cream. Um, There's no doubt that black men are are struggling in a lot of ways. And it's pretty clear since black women are in many ways doing better than black men, it can't just be about racism because the racism affects both black women and black men. There's, mm-hmm. there's a gender component to what's going on with these black men. So to, mm-hmm. to, to continue focusing on black men and in my poor beleaguered city of Baltimore, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of men, a lot of young men who do not have a mentor, you know, a father calling them forth. I mean, that's really what mentorship is sort of about, right? Call, I see you. You got something good there. I know you're looking for something good about yourself. Come, let's do this. So when I was a probation agent, it became very clear. And when I was teaching uh, 24 uh, Inside Out Dad, um, the program for incarcerated fathers, um, you know, you would hear it all the time from these guys. I do not want to do to my kids what my dad did to me. And what their dad did to them, at least in their mind, was my dad left me. What I came Mm. to see a lot is that, yeah, your dad might have left you, but a lot of dads are sort of shown the door and kicked to the curb. Why? Because they don't have any money. And that Mm. is, was but still is to a large degree, especially in neighborhoods that don't have much money and need all they can get. Mm. That still is largely what men are valued for. Not entirely. I mean, there are certainly some very healthy black families, no doubt about that. Um, But more, I think, than for, for the average white family, although white rural families are also having a hard time, Sure. Um, it it is um, it is difficult not having access to that that mentor that person to deal with your insecurities to help you over your insecurities to help you feel like you do have value other than just you know how much money you make. Look, I I, I know you want to accentuate the positive, but I hope you won't mind if I tell you this. I think this is true in other cities up and down the East Coast. I'm not sure how far this ranges, but little boys in Baltimore and young men in Baltimore say, they tell me that every day they hear black men ain't shit. Where where do they go from, where do they go with that? Not typically to a good place. 
And, you know, that's not happening because they're black. That's happening because they're male. And it's it's very sad, and we need to do a better job. Now, accentuate the positive. Things are looking up. You mentioned Warren Farrell. You mentioned Jordan Peterson. There's another fellow on the scene these days named Richard Reeves. Oh, I got the book right there. Okay, very good. Have, <laughs> have you finished fan. it? Have you finished the yes, book? Yes, big fan. Okay, it's, Love it. it's, it's great. He also makes the same point um, by talking about what anthropology teaches us. He quotes David Gilmore, an anthropologist, who wrote a book, I think it was called Manhood in the Making, who identified the essence of what it is to be a man. And, mm -hmm. and I don't know, I don't, I'm not really comfortable with suggesting that there is one thing that all men must have, and if they don't, they're not men. But he does say that anthropologically speaking throughout history, what societies and, and communities have found really helpful for men to be able to do and to want to do and to like to do and to feel appreciated for doing is that they produce more than they consume. Yes. Now, women do that. That's the, that statement, that statement. I, I, so yes. And that is the, we've, we talked a lot about externalities, but built in, I think, to a lot of men, especially a lot of fathers is the concept of, I don't want to be a burden. So we don't share what we're going through. We go into the man cave. We go away on an adventure, come back after slaying the dragon, bring the learning back to the community, not to be a burden. I don't want to ask for help because I'm being a burden, right? There's all these different things. And it's like, and that manifests in that way. The modern version of the books that we're talking about as well, in addition to Dr. Richard Reeves, Dr. Anna Manch Machin, M-A-C-H-I-N, The Making of Modern Dad, anthropological study into the thing, but also using modern examples. So definitely things in the past five, 10 years, as far as surveys and, and feelings and stuff like that. Another fantastic book on the topic, but I don't want to be a burden. And I absolutely love that. Um, but that's also, I mean, while we're talking about, we're talking about things that are uniquely male and what we're dealing with, that's why the suicide rate is four to one. Four, and I, I don't know how to express this. I've been struggling with this. I don't define suicide as success, but four completed suicides for men to one across all demographic. It's, and this is, this statistic is not a US thing. This is global. Across the world, four men commit suicide for every one woman that commits suicide. That is a unique male problem. Do you know the research out of Australia about uh, suicide notes and what the researchers have found were the most common themes inside the mind of men as they commit suicide? No, but I know it's going to break my heart. I feel so worthless and I feel so useless. Hmm. Men want to be valued, appreciated, productive, constructive. They want to give. Now, that's a good thing, but we need to temper that. And, and the best way that I like to point out that we need to temper that is to think about what they tell you on a jet airliner as it's getting ready to take off. What do they tell you? When the mask falls down, and you got a kid next to you, you don't put it on the kid first. What do you do? Put it on yourself first. Yeah. You put it on yourself first. Because to produce, we got to have at least a little raw material input. We got to have a little fuel. It's great if you don't need a lot, but you got to have some. And there is nothing wrong with saying, I, I, I need to eat. I need to breathe. I got to have something here. Hurt people, hurt people, exactly. healed people, healed people. Uh -huh. um, Jack, thank you so much for coming in. This has been um, not definitely not an easy conversation, uh, but absolutely an important one to have. And um, I absolutely love that your focus has been on your city and your community and everything you've been doing. So thank you for that service. Thank you.